Okay, so um, we're now resuming, and maybe you could please state your name and organisation and interest. Uh, thank you, Chairman, uh, Commissioner, uh, for uh, allowing us to come here today. My name's Graham Cameron, and I'm the Secretary of the Taxi Drivers Association of Victoria, okay. and I'm joined by... My, my name is Alan Davis, and I'm past president of the Taxi Industry Council of Australia, and also um, past president of the Taxi Employees League. Okay, well thank you for coming and um, coming forward a little bit earlier at our request. Um, and we have um, your um, reactions to the inquiry and so on, but we'd like to maybe um, tell us, uh, give, give us a general statement, please. I don't know so much about a general statement, uh, no. Chairman, but I, um, so. I think uh, there are 10 issues that I particularly want to raise with okay. the Commission. Um, first one is the entry point for drivers. We find that it would be inappropriate for a, licensing a government or licensing authority to determine who has the right to enter the taxi industry. We believe that it would be unnecessary for the driver to provide a Victorian police record check that uh, to substitute for that though that the Victorian police, the Commissioner of Police or his delegate would determine by way of a tick box on the application form as to whether they believe that the driver or the applicant is a fit and proper person to uh, be accredited as a driver or uh, an operator. Yep. And if they were to reject the application, they may be able to be in a position to give uh, details as to a time frame as to when the applicant may reapply for accreditation. Okay. Uh, in, do, in making that rec in making that uh, submission and suggesting that as a recommendation, we believe it will take away the um, the administrative role of the directorate or the taxi services commission for making arbitrary decisions that then are subject to appeal at VCAT, where in your draft re in your draft report some of those cases have been overturned, if not a majority of those cases. Uh, so in saying that, uh, I think that uh, was pretty clear. We also want to address the issue of driver remuneration. Uh, we also want to address the issue of driver safety, yep. the issue of work cover in and insurance, the issue of vicarious liability in the taxi industry, the issue of rogue operators, uh, training for taxi drivers, the what taxis and the centralised booking service, deregulation as opposed to nationalisation of the industry, and also taxi plate costs. Driver remuneration, that's the big, uh, the big uh, issue that's uh, around taxi drivers. Taxi drivers are currently if they're on a driver lease agreement or a bailment agreement, are sub, uh, subject to certain terms and conditions, as are the operators. The taxi drivers at the moment have a federal award that they're covered under, which is the Transport Passenger Vehicle Award of 2010. The minimum wage that was set by the um, AIRC at the time, which is now Fair Work Australia, was and is $17.08 an hour. Uh, taxi drivers under that federal award would uh, also be recipients of uh, work, working conditions and, and entitlements such as annual leave, sick leave, long service leave, uh, superannuation and the likes. Your draft report identifies the fact that you, one of your recommendations is that taxi drivers receive uh, either a 60-40 split of the uh, fare box 
as you put it, or that they receive, or that they go on to a set pay system of $16 an hour and higher for weekends and peak periods. Uh, we suggest that that's still below, a lot better than what it is, but still below the Fair Work Australia um, minimum wage order or, or minimum uh, award. We also suggest that uh, the four weeks non-payment annual leave provision is absolutely ridiculous because no worker in Australia uh, who, goes, who receives annual leave entitlements uh, receives them uh, for, um, without compensation or by way of holiday pay. Uh, work cover and insurance. This was covered at length yesterday through the Footscray Legal Service and the uh, Federation of Community Legal Centres. I don't want to touch too much about that, but to say that under the business and service standards of taxi operators, they are required to maintain and identify the drivers against loss or damage of the vehicles. They, that is also included in the, bailment, in the taxi bailment agreement as it stands at the moment. They are also required to comply with other uh, acts and regulations, and I'll just get, mention some of them because they were raised yesterday. The Occupational Health and Safety Act, the Accident Compensation Act, the Accident Compensation Work Cover Act, uh, the Equal Opportunity Act, and the Workplace Relations Act, which is now the Fair Work Act. Uh, they don't. That's the B Business and Service Standards document, is it? The, uh, business, the, yeah. the Taxi Industry Accreditation Business and Service Standards yeah. for Taxi Operators been accredited. So, so far as they apply, they're bound by that. As long as they apply, yeah. This was an instrument that was drawn up by the minister, the, sorry, the former minister, Linkowski. So in effect, it's a ministerial directive. Um, the, we've had accidents and deaths in the taxi industry in recent times, and uh, I'd like to point out that these drivers should as it was already indicated to yesterday by uh, Dennis Nettlethorpe, I think his name was, uh, that they should be entitled to work cover, which they are. They should be entitled to transport accident, uh, to make a claim for Transport Accident Commission. Uh, they should be also able to make a claim for crimes compensation when and if there is a crime that has been committed. Uh, vicarious liability, I just want to, uh, I've already identified the fact that they're required by legislation to indemnify the drivers against loss uh, uh, in the case of an accident. Uh, there are several Supreme Court judgments. One that comes to mind is MJ Motors versus Armstrong uh, before Justice Eames. There are several others. Mm -hmm. uh, rogue operators. Well, we've already heard of one uh, being that MJ Motors versus Armstrong, where the driver, uh, where the owner was required to indemnify his driver against loss or operations, we've also heard from previous uh, submissions before this commission that taxi uh, uh, taxi sign or sign ors are exploiting the assignees by the costs involved in. Um, the operation and in fact they are exploiting drivers because they're asking them to pay um, indemnification uh, in regards to an accident which is against the, um, the Act. I believe that these rogue operators should be sought and banished from the industry. To coincide with that, though, there are great there are great operators out there that work, and they work well in conjunction with their drivers, and they look after them uh, as much as they can. At the same time, uh, the 
training of drivers. This is very dear to my heart as a trainer, as a former taxi driver, and uh, as a uh, former for, former committee member on the consult the VTD's consultative committee into driver training. Uh, I suggested at the time when I was a member of that committee that they fast track drivers into the industry, and that they can do this through the national. Uh, using the Australian Qualifications Framework, as set, uh, which is the national uh, standards, and uh, they can meet competency by way of tests or the process known as credit transfer or recognition of prior knowledge in the industry or recognition of prior knowledge. Um, that works rather well, so they can do that by way of assessment of the person's knowledge in the first place. Um, determining what competencies the driver or the operator has and then do gap, what's known as gap training to pick up the, uh, um, what's, what is lacking from the applicant. Uh, we believe also that the training is below the standard of that of a hairdresser. So in effect, a hairdresser is more qualified to cut your hair than a taxi driver is to drive a taxi. We say this because a certificate three in hairdressing is far greater than a certificate two in taxi, in driver, oper in driver operations taxi, which is the current course that's being taught there. We're saying that those levels should, be, should come up to at least a certificate three for the driver and at least a certificate four for the operator. And uh, it also would meet the necessity that, or, or the gap in the knowledge or the English and numeracy components as identified by uh, Dennis Nettlefold yesterday, where they, can't, where they don't have a grasp of understanding complex workplace uh, documents. Just, can I just interrupt for a second with the that kind of thing. Just um, wonder if you could analyse for a minute the impact on wages or income of drivers setting higher training tests and that kind of thing, with and without uh, adding on a law about sixty forty or minimum so wage. So what's that? Sorry. Well, uh, scenario one you increase training and do nothing else for drivers, what would the impact be on wages? And two, uh, scenario two, where you bring in a 60 40. 40 or something like that. I was going to get to the fair structure a Thank little you. bit later. All right, OK. But, do it um, later if you like. Uh, so what, what, in, what in central booking services? Now, this was trialled by... by um, Regal combined back in the late 80s, early 90s, and it was found to be a failure. Now, whether it was because of the fact that, of the way that they were operating it at the time, the reason why I know this is because I was an operator, at, a radio operator at Silvertop Taxis, and I had to allocate work for uh, the M50 or the Watt Taxis at the time. And we gave them a rain shoot at the start of the day, and they just worked off that. And then that was prior to the introduction of the Central Booking Service. Central Booking Service, I was then seconded to Regal uh, combined to look after the, um, the multi-purpose uh, taxi program and the, uh, the Watt Taxis, as they're now known, um, and tried to set up some sort of system like that. It just failed because you call in, there was far too much demand on the service for ASAP customers. Um, if they pre-booked, then it was a little bit more uh, conducive. They were able to at least be able to be allocated a car. And then if Mrs Jones rang back and said, my car's not here, it's 11 o'clock, where is it? At least we'll be able to call the driver up that's been allocated that job and say, well, how far away are you? And nine times out of ten, he's 10 or 15 minutes behind. Sometimes he could be up to a half an hour behind. Um, good idea. 
but um, how are you going to implement it unless you take them out of the current network service providers and make it exclusively a, um, a, a new network service provider um, uh, for that particular purpose, for those particular vehicles. At the same time, I was disgusted to learn that there were quite a number of uh, uh, disabled customers uh, who were being left left beside a taxi ranks, and one that comes to mind is the one in Danny on in more recent times. Excuse me. <coughs> Apologies for that. Um, where she was waiting at a taxi rank and waiting for an hour, or in, the, in I think in some cases up to two or three hours. In that case, well, not knowing the circumstances of that case uh, specifically, but from what I can read from the photos that I saw in the paper and the like, I think that particular uh, passenger was actually in a wheelchair that could be collapsed or folded up and put into a boot of a, tax, of a conventional taxi or into the back seat of a taxi. If this is the case, I believe that that should be the, the option that's given to the uh, to that pas particular passenger using those services at the time that they're booking. Um, do you have do you have a motorised wheelchair, yes or no? Um, and if the answer is yes, uh, sorry, if the answer is no, would you be, would you be uh, okay if you travelled in a conventional taxi as a last resort? Um, I'll get to the fare box because you're pretty interested in the fare box and the, co and the cost of plates. First of all, I want to talk about the cost of plates. What you haven't been told is that these taxi licences were initially issued by the government. You probably knew that anyway. But so it, they were issued for zero dollars. Now there were some in more recent times, a dollar for the for some of the watt taxes, fifty thousand, etc., etc., and then we have uh, some costs for the PS plates. They were non-transferable and uh, could not be could not be assigned. Uh, there were exceptions to the could not be assigned rule, and that was for a driver, for an operator or an owner that had been in the industry for some ten years wanted to take some long service leave and uh, they could assign for no more than six months so that they can take that leave and then they came back and took over the running and the operation of the assignment. Included in the fare, I want to tell you, so that was, so that's where we are. Also in the plates, you'll be, uh, it probably not surprise you that the High Court has made a determination with respect to uh, taxi plates and there is no goodwill in taxi plates. So I say that because how come the plates are so expensive if there is no goodwill? It's not like a milk bar that you're getting customers, you've got stock, uh, it's not like any other business. Yet, for some reason, they can monopoly, they can, uh, they've got a monopoly and they can trade on that monopoly. The cost of the plate and the fare, so I mentioned the cost of the plate, the fare. Incorporated in the fare is a component for driver's wages. The, not, the last fare I submission I, was, I saw from the Victorian Taxi Direct, so the Victorian Taxi Association, was for a driver's remuneration which was based on the federal passenger vehicle award at the time, which was about $15 or $16 an hour. And under that federal passenger vehicle award, taxi drivers were expressly excluded. So they didn't come under that award at all. What they were covered by was a state-based award little less than the Federal Passenger Vehicle Award, but not, not with stating a state-based award, and we've had a state-based award 
since about 1913. In fact, taxi drivers were part of the eight-hour day movement. And that's attested to by the memorial for those who participated that uh, is up at Trades Hall Council. Uh, so looking at the fair, why aren't drivers getting paid the appropriate wage if it's incorporated in the fair? Well, we've got a middleman in the system and he's the assignor <coughs> who assigns his plate for around about anywhere between $2,000 and $3,000. Preferred that. If you've got that middleman in the middle, there's no money to pay wages to drivers. If you take the middleman out, as is effectively being proposed in your draft recommendations, and I say that loosely because effectively you're saying that uh, you can purchase a taxi for $20,000, well, why would you be paying $2,000 a month to an owner to an owner to, a, to assign who assigns his plate to you when you can purchase a plate for $20,000. In fact, why would you purchase a plate for $20,000 when you can go out and get a PBO for $2,000 and do exactly the same thing? Now, there's a, bit of limit, there's a bit of a limitation there because the PBO can't take street hails, can't sit on ranks. But in reality, what will happen is hey, I'm going to hail this PBR, driver pulls over, so I'm sorry I can't take you because you'd need to ring me beforehand, but hey, here's my telephone number and I'm here. Isn't that a good service for you? Okay, by the, the way, we're I, I just want to. Sure. I just, I've just got one more comment. Good. Right? And that is the Federal Minister for Transport, um, Infrastructure and Regional Australia, uh, the Honourable um, Anthony Albanese, set minimum standards for taxi drivers in 2010. They're national standards. And uh, I, I said at the time, and in fact at, at around about that same time, I, I addressed a uh, New South Wales parliamentary inquiry into taxi corruption. And I said at the time that they are below the standards that were set in 2000. So we're now dumbing down our workforce effectively. I support the whole process of national uh, competency standards for taxi drivers, but they, this, this goes back to my original point of the training. We need to train up our workforce, not dumb down. Um, and that's all I have to say, uh, Chairman well, and Commissioner. Thank you. Well, in the time, that's great, and we will leave it at that uh, but, um, because of the general timetable. But thank you very much. We've listened to every one of your points. I oh, thank you for your submission. Um, can I just address? Yeah. Um, there's an overlying issue within the um, licence issue and wages of the owner-operator of what you call the loan-to-value value ratio of plates. Many of the owners have actually borrowed against that plate, and I'm not sure whether there have been any studies done on the actual overall equity and loan-to-value ratios within the industry. Um, as a driver, I don't want to see any of the owners going broke. Um, we've got bank's interest, and the thing is, if you create a black hole by suddenly taking away from the owners their value and introducing a, another value, um, what happens to that black hole? Is it met by government? Is it met by Treasury? And I'm not sure whether any Treasury models have been done to look at that. Um, the wages. Um, the minimum wage at the moment is over $600 um, per week. The uh, big issue is how can the industry, um, under economic viability, meet that demand? So the economic viability is a major issue, I think, which this inquiry needs to look at as to 
um, how do the comp different components fit into a whole and who has each slice of that particular cake and how best is it addressed. The drivers are asking for more wages and when you look at the health and welfare of drivers, um, the basic socioeconomic standards are well below average. Many owners out there are struggling because of the economic conditions. Whether we need a fair rise, I think we do, to meet the current demands and then a CPI increase. But the economic sort of strategy is something I think we need to address. Thank you very much. Can I just take that point, just, just on that, and I will be brief on this. Um, we're, we're saying if you take away the assignees, there'd be enough money in the current fare box to pay the wages. So you wouldn't have to increase wages. There wouldn't be need for a 60-40 split for, uh, in favour of drivers. And uh, you'd be able to account for that. At the same time, we've, I've sat here today and I've heard owners and operators in country mainly um, complaining about the fact that uh, the cost of LPG has, has risen. And um, uh, I wrote a letter to the Ballarat Courier and I said, um, in 2008, the, the cost that was set by the... Pro, uh, by the Essential uh, Services Commission. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, but, um, was 57 cents uh, per litre. And it had risen, so they so they got a fair rise based on the fair based on the uh, LPG price of fifty seven cents a litre. Since they were they received that increase, there has been twenty two of the twenty four up until January of this year uh, months where the price of LPG was below the fifty seven cents mark, and so therefore they have been profiteering effectively by not putting aside or setting aside 57 cents per kilometre uh, or 50 cents, 57 cents per, per litre when they, when they were getting it at a lower price. And when they were getting, now that it's come to a higher price, they say, we want a gap. We need 20% we need 20 increase in the fare. No, we don't. We just need you to manage your business a bit more prudent and fiscally, and if we do need a fair rise, then it would be based on CPI adjustments only between now and then, and no, they should receive no compensation uh, for the fact that there's a, an LPG rise in the shortfall because they've gained over yep. those short months. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much, Chairman. Thank you. Very good.